All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone, for the second seminar, second HEP seminar of the fall. Today we have Julia Gerlein from uh, Brookhaven, postdoc at Brookhaven, visiting us uh, tomorrow as well. She did her PhD in Madrid and her undergraduate and master's degree at uh, Karlsruhe in Germany. And today she will tell us about neutrino oscillation uh, experiments. And Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the kind invitation to be here today. It's my first in person talk in a very long while. <laughs> so I'm very excited. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to talk, going to talk about CT violating the two non standard interaction in long range accelerator data. This is a work I've done last year together with Peter Dent and Rebecca Fest. So the observation of neutrino oscillation provides very strong evidence for physics beyond the standard one. In fact, the observation of massive neutrinos is one of the few hints we have for new physics. Um, neutrino oscillations happen because of flavor eigenstates of the weak interaction and the mass eigenstates of the neutrinos are not aligned. In fact, they are related by a mixing matrix, the PMNS matrix. This matrix can be parameterized with four uh, parameters, three angles, and at least one phase. Um, this means that the observation of neutrino oscillations introduced more parameters of the, uh, to the standard model. In the standard parameterization of the PM and S matrix, as a series of three rotations, we have three new mixing angles and one phase. And then we also have this diagonal matrix, which contains two more phases. However, this diagonal matrix is only suitable for Majorana neutrinos and oscillation experiments, the experiments we're going to talk about in the following, are not sensitive to these phases. For this reason, I'm not going to talk about um, them further. This means we are left with these four parameters, three angles, and one phase. And of course, we want to measure these parameters to learn more about the neutrino scale. The way to measure these parameters is an oscillation experiment. Here, the idea is that you produce a neutrino of flavor alpha with an energy E. Then the probability to detect the neutrino of a different flavor beta at a, at a distance L <laughs> um, is given by this expression here. So it depends on sine squared to theta, where theta is the mixing angle, and sine squared of um, delta M L over 4 E, where the delta M squared is defined as you can see here. The mixing angle gives us the amplitude of the uh, probability and the mass plating gives us a frequency. So to measure then this oscillation probability in a very simplistic way, you have um, oscillation experiments, which have a linear detector, which measure the, um, uh, the number of, of neutrinos of, of flavor alpha, and then you compare it to the number of um, event at the power detector, which measure the neutrinos of flavor beta. And the ratio of this, this is the oscillation probability. So many experiments have already measured the mixing angles and the mass splitting, and there is impressive uh, agreement between different experiments. And here I show um, this an example, um, for example, in the atmospheric sector, where we have one mass splitting, delta m to one squared, and the mixing angle theta two three. In colors, I show the constraints from um, BCOR and super K, which are experiments which use atmospheric neutrinos. And in red, green, and uh, purple, I show the uh, results from T2K Nova Minos, which are experiments which use accelerator neutrinos. So, as you can see, even though these experiments are very different, they use uh, neutrinos from different sources and they have very different detectors, um, all provide the same um, um, results basically. In global fits, um, all the wealth of the neutrino data has been co uh, combined. And we have now a complete picture of the mixing angles in the neutrino sector, which are shown on this plot. We know that one mixing angle is large, around maximal, which means 45 degrees. We have another big mixing angle, theta uh, 1, 2, which is around 33 degrees. And we have um, a small mixing angle around um, 8.5 degrees, this is theta 1, 3. As you can see, the largest uncertainty right now is in the mixing angles in the two three. It is also surprising that the mixing angles in the left hand sector are very big. 
in particular if you compare it to the mixing in the quark sector. Here um, I show the comparison of the mixing matrix in the electron sector versus the one in the quark sector, where more purple means um, it's close, this matrix element is closer to one. So in the quark matrix, we have um, very small flavor mixing. In the neutrino mix, uh, matrix, we have very big flavor mix. So we also have um, measures of mass splittings in the neutrino sector. We have one large mass splitting, delta m32 squared, and one smaller mass splitting, delta m21 squared. However, we only know the sign of the smaller mass splitting. We do not know the sign of um, this mass splitting here, which means the neutrino mass ordering is, is currently unknown. There are two options for the neutrino mass ordering. Neutrinos could be ordered normal. This means that the lightest neutrino has the largest amount of electron neutrino, or the neutrino mass ordering is inverted, where the lightest neutrino has the least amount of electron neutrino. So coming back now to the uh, mixing angles, since all three of them are non-zero, the possibility for CP violation arises in the electronic mixing matrix. This uh, parameter which governs the CP violation is um, the phase delta, which is currently the least known parameter of the electronic mixing matrix. And of course, we want to measure this parameter. Um, we already know that um, in the standard model, weak interactions uh, violate um, CP maximally. We, um, it seems like a strong interaction, on the other hand, does not violate CP. So this is uh, the question why CP is conserved there. It's a strong CP problem. Um, we also have in the quark sector, CP violation in a quark um, mixing matrix, the CKM matrix. And here we can quantify the amount of CP violation by the basis invariant, the Yarskog invariant, which is defined as uh, you can see here. This invariant depends on the sign of the three um, mixing angles as well as on the sign of the CP violating phase delta. Using the unitarity of the three types of mixing matrix, we also obtain a maximum value of the yard cooking variant. Since we already have a very good uh, knowledge of the CKM matrix in the quark sector, we know and a ratio of um, the yard cooking variant um, CKM over its maximal value, and it turns out that it's actually rather small. So even though um, the bit of non-zero uh, non value for delta and the CKM matrix, the CP, CP violation is small in this sector. So the question is, um, what is the value of the art coping variant in the lepton sector? So is CP violated in the lepton sector as well or not? So how does one measure CP violation in the lepton sector? So um, CP violation can only take place in experiment experiments. These are experiments where you start with a neutrino of a certain flavor and detect um, neutrinos of a, of a different flavor. If you look at um, disappearance experiments, where also the final, uh, the final state flavor is the same as the initial state flavor, this channel is its own T conjugate, and since CPT is conserved, it's also its um, own CP conjugate. Then we also need an oscillation channel where all three flavors play a role, because we need to have to have the interference of two contributions in the oscillator probability to um, provide a sensitivity to the phase. And these two contributions in the probability are given by the two neutrino mass splittings. And then from a technical point of view, um, it's very easy to produce new neutrinos. You produce them in uh, pion decays. And this leaves us basically with the channel of new neutrinos going to tau neutrinos or new neutrinos going to electron neutrinos. Since it's rather hard to um, detect tau neutrinos, because you need to have a very large energy of the neutrino beam to produce the tau neutrinos in the final and the tau leptons in the final state. Um, the um, channel of choice is the oscillation channel mu neutrinos going to electron neutrinos. And due to matter effects, this channel is also sensitive to the mass ordering. 
There are currently two experiments which, aim, which are set out to measure RCP violation in the medical sector. The NOVA experiment, which is a US-based experiment, and the T2K experiment in Japan. The NOVA experiment uses neutrinos from the new Medine Experiment and it has its polytector here um, at the river. The neutrinos in the NOVA experiment have an energy of 1.6 GV and they travel uh, 810 kilometers. The matter density the neutrinos encounter is 2.84 grams of cc. Um, the T2K experiment is located in Japan. It uses neutrinos from the j part beam. The neutrinos in this experiment have a lower energy and they also travel a lower distance. The matter density the neutrinos encounter on their way to the polytech that also lower is 3 grams of cc. So both experiments then um, provided a um, showed the most recent results last year at the Neutrino 2020 conference, which uh, was a virtual meeting where the whole neutrino community came together to discuss the recent state of the field. And here you see um, what the um, what the current status um, is. So we see on the y-axis side squared p that is three, and on the x-axis we have data. So both experiments prefer novel ordering over inverted ordering. In blue, you see the preference from the NOVA experiments. And you see that in general, the um, NOVA does not have a strong preference for any value of the CP violation phase. The best fit value is around delta equal to pi. However, NOVA excludes this region here at the 90% confidence level. T2K, on the other hand, is um, the preferred region is shown in black here. And T2K has a preference for delta equal to 3 pi over 2. And the preferred region of T2K is exactly in the region which is not preferred by NOVA. This leads to a slight disagreement at a two sigma level between these two experiments. Now it's only a slight disagreement, um, nothing to worry about. However, this could also be the hint for some uh, some quantum physics. So, uh, is that maybe new physics hiding? So, the difference between NOVA and T2K is the baselines and the matter density that the trios encounter. At NOVA, um, the baseline is longer, the energies are higher, and they, uh, the neutrinos have a stronger matter effect there. So any new physics solution could be related to this difference. This means we could try to introduce new matter interactions for neutrinos, and this is done in the framework of neutrino non-standard interactions. Um, the, the, so we add um, to the Lagrangian this term for the neutrino non-standard interactions. Um, we have this parameter epsilon, which gives the strength of the interaction relative to the weak interaction. And then we have just the coupling of the neutrinos to standard model fermions. Um, these non standard interactions, they affect oscillations via the matter effect, as I show in the Hamiltonian here. The one here, this is just the standard charge current uh, matter effect, the electron neutrinos to counter. And then we also see that the whole matrix is populated with flavor diagonal. Um, and this I parameters and all the flavor of the element in this I parameter, which kind of complex. The matter potential A here, this is proportional to the, uh, the thermal constant, the matter density, but also the energy. Um, in the following, I'm going to focus on uh, factorial non standard interactions and focus on flavor changing parameters. This leaves us. Uh, us with six real parameters we are going to study in the following the absolute value and the phase of um, the flavor changing and the side parameters. And for simplicity, we will also only consider the following one complex parameter at a time. So um, before I will come to the results, we will first look at some analytical estimates and then I will show you our numerical results. Our assumption for the analytical estimates is that the non-standard interactions only affect the measurement of the CP violating phase, whereas the mixing angle and the mass splitting they remain unaffected. 
then we can um, compare the oscillation probability with and without the presence of NSI and use some approximate expressions um, for the oscillation probabilities in low baseline um, experiments from this reference to obtain an estimate of magnitude and the phase of the NSI parameter, which we need to resolve this by tension. So in this leads us to this expression for the absolute value of the um, NSI parameter. So we see, so plugging in um, the adequate um, values of the parameters here, we find that the absolute value of epsilon e mu and epsilon e tau needs to be around 0 0.2. We can also now um, cross check if our approximation makes sense. So for example, if T to K and NOVA would have measured the same value for CT violating phase, this would mean that this term here is zero. This means also epsilon is zero. And we uh, do not need to resolve any tension, of course. On the other hand, if T to K and NOVA have the same uh, matter effect, then uh, the denominator here is zero. Then our, F, uh, our LSI parameter needs to be infinitely large to resolve any tension. We can also do a similar game for to estimate the phase of the LSI parameter using now that there is a difference between the measurement of delta from T2K okay and NOVA and that NOVA have larger matter effects. We find that we would expect that the true value of delta is the one measured by T2K, okay, which is 3 pi over 2, and that the phase of the MSI parameter needs to be 3 pi over 2. Uh, we have a question, yes? Yeah, so, 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 so I, I'm confused. So, where does the new physics get encoded? It's only in the non diagonal term, or, the, or it can also be encoded in the diagonal. Yeah, so we are going to focus only on the new physics in the off diagonal terms um, because we, we are looking at, at flavor changing uh, oscillation channels, and the um, off diagonal terms are going to be the most important ones there. Of course, in principle, we could also include um, some diagonal um, effects here, but we did, uh, we for simplicity, we don't expect the, them to be overly important, and they are probably not going to able to resolve this uh, system attention. So we focused for simplicity also on just one of the parameter at a time. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if your epsilon is 0.2, does that affect? Beta decay experiments or cosmology, maybe you'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, so I will come back to this um, later. So, um, as you can see here, basically in the Lagrangian, um, if you have uh, relatively large epsilon, your point is relatively large, I would say 10% of the weak interaction, um, it would affect all the couplings of neutrinos to strong and bonded fermions. So, you would expect also like cosmology to show um, effect there on um, beta decay. Um, however, as, as we are focusing on the um, flavor changing parameters, uh, we don't have an effect on beta decay. And for cosmology, um, the effect is uh, relatively weak, but I will come uh, back later to uh, other effects of NSI. So moving on to our numerical results, I'm focusing on the oscillations uh, right now. So for um, our numerical results, we take into account appearance and disappearance data. Remember appearance data, this is um, the channel where we look at electron neutrinos in the final state, and we parameterize the number of electron neutrinos at the file detector um, like this. So we take into account, um, so set parameterizes the background, um, X and Y, this is um, a real number, which is the product, the weighted product of um, the um, mu neutrino flux times the cross section. And as you can see in the lower plot here, we also need to take into account uh, wrong sign uh, leptons, in a, a, a particularly in the anti neutrino mode. As you can see here at orange, we also have a contribution to the number of events coming from the thumb. Neutrinos. So we then fit um, to, to obtain uh, the values for x, y, and z. We fit the oscillation probability to uh, points on the bi probability plot, which is um, 
an example of such a process shown here. Then we have used also disappearance data. Here we use ONOVA, field results from another publication, and T2K provided on us with the likelihood of the disappearance data. And then finally, we also need to include information from other experiments for the remaining parameters. In particular, for T013 and uh, Delta M32 squared, we use information from Dia Bay. Dia Bay uh, was a reactor experiment. Um, reactor experiment means they use um, electron neutrinos from beta decay at the reactor and they detect that very close to the source. So there are no matter effects, and this means that these parameters here, they're basically maximum parameters, there's no effect of MSI. Hammond, um, this is also a um, reactor experiment. Uh, also, in this case, we take information for T012 and the other mass printing from there. These are again also maximum parameters. And then finally, from snow, snow tells us the sign of this mass printing here. So then we can uh, do a combined analysis of the T2K and NOVA data using our priors on um, um, these parameters here on this slide. So I can come now uh, to the results we have obtained. So first for the standard oscillation parameters, here I show the results um, on, left, uh, on the left side for normal ordering and right side for inverted ordering. And the results are shown in the science squared theta 2, 3 um, plane over the yards of invariant. In uh, blue, you see uh, NOVA, and in red, you see T2K. And in orange, that's the combination of NOVA and T2K together. What you see from these two plots is that the combination of NOVA and T2K together this uh, is more compatible in inverted ordering. In fact, inverted ordering is preferred over normal ordering at a depth of 12 2.3. So what does this mean? This means that the discrepancy between these two measurements can be slightly resolved if you swap the mass ordering. So in NOVA and T2K individually prefer normal ordering over inverted ordering. However, the combination of these two experiments prefers inverted ordering. There's another experiment, Superfamilia Panda, which is also sensitive to the mass ordering, still prefers normal ordering. The combination of these three experiments again prefers normal ordering. And then finally, in the near future reactor experiments, which is the Juno, we provide information on the mass ordering. So um, swapping the mass ordering, this is uh, just, I would say, a standard model way of resolving. On this tension, now I'm moving to uh, non standard interactions, but these are way to resolve this tension. Here I show our results in the plane of the phase of um, the NSI parameter and its absolute value. I'm showing the results for epsilon e mu and epsilon e tau. Um, as it turns out, this epsilon mu tau, I'll have to copy the appendix. This cannot really resolve the tension. Um, we didn't find um, a good uh, fit for this. And it's a parameter. So in uh, blue, you see the best fit point for the NSI parameter, and the orange region they are preferred over the standard model. And you see that our best fit uh, region here um, is actually already constrained by ice cube data. So ice cube data, uh, ice cube um, uses atmospheric neutrinos and um, can also constrain NSI because the atmospheric neutrinos travel through the whole Earth. And um, as you can see, the ice cube constraints, which rule out everything to the right of this line, they rule out our best fit point. However, still a very good um, chunk of parameter space is not ruled out by IPT yet. We can also compare now our analytical estimates to our numerical uh, results. So as a reminder for our analytical estimates, we estimated that to resolve the tension, we would need an absolute value of the NSI parameters around 0 0.2, a phase 3 pi over 2, and the true, uh, true value of delta is also 3 pi over 2. Now, in this table, I show you our numerical results for both mass ordering normal and inverted. We see that for normal mass ordering, uh, numerically, we find that the absolute value is indeed uh, around 0 
The phase of the NSI parameter is indeed around 3 pi over 2, the true value of delta, again 3 pi over 2. Then I also show um, the delta chi split, which is the difference between um, chi split for, uh, for the standard model and um, the NS, uh, NSI scenario. And you see that um, introducing epsilon e mu, the delta chi spread is uh, around 4.4. So this can fully resolve the tension, and in particular, it can resolve the tension better than just swapping the mass order ring, which led to a delta chi squared of 2.3. You also see that the delta chi squared for epsilon mu tau in normal ordering is rather small, so this tension is not really resolved introducing this MSI parameter. And in particular, you also see that for invert ordering, the delta chi squared are not particularly high either. So we find um, that only with epsilon e mu and epsilon e tau, which places and absolute values of um, the MSI parameter, as, as you can see in the table, we can resolve the tension. So I already showed you some uh, combinatorial constraints on MSI parameters. So um, the effect of MSI grows with energy, distance, and the density. This means in epsilon mu tau, is best probed with atmospheric neutrinos. Epsilon uh, e mu and e tau are best probed with long baseline appearance um, and atmospheric neutrinos. I already showed you the ice cube um, curve, which is again shown here in the flower plot, which slightly lifts this favors our um, best split point from Tito Cayenova. However, as you can see, this upper plot here also prefers non zero epsilon e mu at a one sigma level. Um, Super Kamiokanda, which is also sensitive to atmospheric neutrinos in the same way ice cube is sensitive to them. They, however, so far only considered real LSI parameters. However, their sensitivity should be uh, similar to ice cube, and their constraints on the absolute value of MSI parameters is also com uh, comparable to what ice cube has as constraint. Then um, we can also look at scattering constraints on NSI parameters. So just as a reminder, the framework for the NSI um, is given again here. So um, as um, NSI affects coupling of neutrinos to any standard model terminals, it will also affect the neutrino standard model uh, scatterings. For example, in processes like SEVENS. SEVENS stands for coherent elastic neutrino nuclear scattering. The cross section for this process depends on the weak charge, and the weak charge is changed in the process in the um, presence of NSI, as I show here. So we have a change um, coming from the diagonal NSI parameters, but also from the off diagonal NSI parameters. However, as you can see already here, um, this process does is not sensitive to any complex um, NSI phases. This means the severance is again only constrained to absolute value of the MSI parameter. And we did that because the severance process has been detected for the first time in 2016 by the coherent collaboration. It took um, over 70 years uh, to actually detect this process because the final state of, of severance is a low energy polynuclear, which is simply. Um, Experimentally, very hard to detect such low weak point energies. Um, then, um, these NSI constraints I'm showing uh, here in this plot, they apply to mediators above 10 MeV. The reason for this is that in order to write down um, the NSI in, in the way I'm doing it here in an effective field theory, theory framework, of course, the mediator mass needs to be larger than the momentum exchange. And in the um, sample of sevens, this applies to mediators, which, which are uh, heavier than 10 MeV. Then um, in this publication, together with Peter Denton, we looked at the data and used the Feldman-Cousins -Cousin, Feldman framework to derive constraints. And um, if you only focus on the blue uh, constraints, not marginalized means we're only looking at one NSI parameter at a time. And you see that the off diagonal and design parameters, they are constrained from sevens around epsilon smaller, 
0 0.2, maybe 0 0.1 for epsilon e tau. So again, all these scattering processes can give you constraints, and they are in fact complementary to um, constraints from oscillation experiments. However, the preferred region of NSI parameters, which is required to solve um, slight discrepancy between the measurements of theta k and nova, um, they are in agreement with all other experimental constraints from oscillations, but also from scattering. So further constraints, uh, future constraints from atmospheric machines will be very important because um, from, um, constraints from ice cube and super k, because these experiments are also sensitive to the phase of the NSI parameter. Furthermore, this NSI solution can also be probed in the future with the uh, Dune and TPU hyperphase. Dune is um, the US flagship um, experiment. Uh, um, for long baseband neutrinos in the future. And Dune will have a broad band um, theme, which means Dune itself will be sensitive to the NSI parameters. T2 hyper K is the successor of T2K and um, will, in principle, measure the same as T2K has measured. And then finally, the distinction between the standard model solution to this um, slight tension, which means the slope of the mass ordering from normal to inverted, and the BSM solution I presented here with NSI can be, dist can be distinguished in the future with um, the reactor experiment that Juno, which is currently under construction and is going to uh, come online next year. Of course, it will take a while until they have um, their measurement of the mass ordering, but Juno will definitely tell us which mass ordering is realized in nature. And then maybe it will turn out that even though the scope of the mass ordering cannot fully absorb the tension between the two and nova, maybe we are ready for the first thing of an inverse mass ordering in this data. So um, let me summarize and conclude. I think I was a bit fast, but okay. So um, there is the open question of CP violation in the electronic sector, which is going to be solved in the, in the near future um, with uh, current experiments like T2K NOVA, but ultimately with use. In the current data of T2K and NOVA, there is a slight tension in the measurement of the CP violation phase. This tension can be um, partially resolved by swapping the mass ordering from normal to inverted. However, this tension can be fully resolved by introducing complex non-standard interactions. Um, we predict um, maximum CP violation in the electronic mixing matrix, but also for the new physics. Um, this is, of course, um, very exciting if this were to be true. Uh, the future will tell us T2K and NOVA are still um, running and are going to run until basically June will come up. So um, yeah, stay tuned for the next couple of years and for the ultimate resolution if CP is violated in the electronic mixing matrix or not. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julia. Uh, any questions? So I want to talk about the mass scale of the mediator. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is the What's this, the, the constraints from ice cube? Or that's a pretty high center of mass, right? Yeah. So um, for let me quickly go to the oscillations. So for oscillations, these constraints they apply to all mediator masses. So I um, mean for I mean for oscillations, you don't really have um, a momentum transfer. So the ice cube constraints, they apply for all mediator masses, there's a scattering constraint, and we do have a momentum transfer there. They only apply um, for mediator masses above a certain uh, uh, mass for seven is a 10 MeV mass. Even if you dial these down, it's the same basic form because it's forward. Exactly, scattering. exactly. So NSI and oscillations always um, has a Lagrangian like this and always shows up in the Hamiltonian like this. So in the limit that I have a massless mediator, then what's the dimension full scale that then goes into the right? You're saying that yeah. so so like imagine that imagine that um, there were a flavor violating massless 
particle. Mm -hmm. So I can't write that, right? Yes. So what's the? Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah, I, I'm not sure right now. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I haven't thought about it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a good point of. Maybe there's no forward scattering or something. Yeah. I think this might be the solution now. Yeah. And let me think about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, um, so. If it if one thing it wasn't clear to me, if it comes out that it's inverted ordering, mm -hmm. does that then squeeze the lab parameter space for NSI or it's basically the same? Yeah. So um if nature is indeed um, has in feet in vertical freedom mass ordering, then um basically if you introduce this complex NSI parameters, I mean, first of all. <laughs> There wouldn't be there wouldn't be uh, so the tension between two plane nova would be reduced already because that the uh, the combination is more compatible with inverse ordering. But if you additionally um, in, introduce a complex NSI, you would maybe reduce the tension a little bit more. But it's uh, let me let me check if I actually have um, inverse ordering. Yeah, I think that's exactly. So here you see um, inverted ordering con results for epsilon mu tau. And for example, here for epsilon mu tau, as you uh, provides very strong constraints, so the preferred parameter space would be anyway already um, excluded. So yeah, I mean, basically the the answer to your question is the NSI parameter space would even be more squeezed. That's that's correct. And I don't think you would necessarily need to introduce NSI to resolve any tension between the two nova because it's this tension is already there. Okay. Uh, so it's somewhat tangential to talk, but you mentioned in the beginning there is this alpha one of the two parameters in the Mirana case. Yes. So I don't recall seeing those. Can you say a yeah. few words? What, what did you, you, said, you said that they don't appear in the installation experiments. So how, how to measure those? And exactly. So um, if you go to the PMF metrics, uh, yes. So exactly. So these uh, Majorana phases, they are only physical if the genus are Majorana particles. In this well. case, um, they cannot be absorbed in any field rating conditions. This means they rely on the fact that neutrinos are minor particles, so we would need to measure them in a process um, which is electron number violating, and the process of where we're trying to measure those would be the neutrinos that go into the experiments. Um, these experiments, um, they, they are very tough to perform. Um, right now, they only provide upper limits on the observable in this process. And of course, this observable depends on the spaces. Um, but right now, we don't have any hints that neutrinos are Majorana particles. And also, since oscillation, they do not rely on the fact uh, or, or of the, on the difference between uh, Majorana and Eros neutrinos. This means that these spaces do not show up in any oscillation probability. And we can just ignore them if we are only focusing on on, on oscillation. But are they CT violation also? Because yes. it's complex. So is there some CT violation effects in double beta decay? Um so double beta decay, not sure double beta decay itself is not CT violating. Right. Um I mean, you, I mean, if you're doing a beta decay, you're measuring one quantity and you have two phases. Right. So you are only going to be sensitive to the difference of these two phases. 
um, they could still, I mean, both of them could still be CP violating, but you probably wouldn't know this by measuring just this one quantity in two microns of the case. Maybe the endpoints would be different for those neutrinos that will be able to okay, look to yeah, you want to but that sounds like a really hard measurement on an already <laughs> extremely hard measurement. Exactly, exactly. I mean, um, the, the only accessible way to the space is with neutrinos don't be to decay. And um, I mean, it would be great to do something like neutrinos don't be to decay with new neutrinos, but we don't have to be to decay with new neutrinos, so that's okay. Yeah. So if you want to design the, the, the way of like detecting these NSI this way is, it seems sort of indirect, right? In some sort of like overall parameter space constraining fashion, where it's like, mm -hmm. if you wanted to design an NSI searching experiment from the ground up, what would you do? Yeah, so I think I would, I would try to design like probably come up with a process where there is no standard model contribution, so which is impossible in the standard model in some way. And then, um, but possible if you have new mediators or some NSI. I'm not sure what kind of process this would be, which, which would only point towards NSI and there is like no standard model, pro, uh, standard model contribution to this at all. But this is probably um, one of the cleanest ways I could think of. Are there short baseline experiments you could do with NSI? And um, then you could maybe put some lead in between. Or, or... Yes. So what I've talked about, this is NSI propagation. So this means that um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just involving NSI here in the Hamiltonian in the propagation, similar like the standard model matter effect. There is there could also be um, NSI in production or detection. This means, for example, that NSI and new mediator could affect um, pion decays, for example. That just pion decay um, rate or the energy spectrum of the neutrinos is different. This could also happen. But again, um, a similar effect could also, for example, happen if um, the PMS matrix is non unitary. So if the uh, free time three matrix we're talking about is just a subset of um, a real 10 times n, maybe 4 times 4, um, math matrix which involves also sterile energy. Um, I mean, there are some publications um, or currently working on something which tries to figure out how to distinguish NSI and uh, non unitarity in um, such effects, like in the case of mesons. Um, but for a large heat of parameter space, uh, they look rather similar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, my question is, is just following the former discussion. So, if we just if we impose some new experiment like a, like a test non unitarity for the for me I'm confused because here for the non diameter which have six six parameters totally right so mm -hmm. how do we just make difference because still seems the constraints not much many enough to make difference of all these parameters. Yes. So what I talked about is I just focused on one of them and not all of them at the same time. Yeah. So um so are there any preference of which one would be more viable? Yes, yes. So indeed, so numerically, we in, we do find that, um, yeah, if you just look at the delta chi squared, that epsilon e mu can um, is a better fit to the data than epsilon e tau, for example. Um, this is uh, related a little bit on uh, what mass eigenstate dominates uh, sorry dominates um, in the in long baseline experiments. So long baseline experiments they're dominated by uh, mass state M3 um, on U3 in the propagation. Um, and since we also involve um, electron neutrinos in the final state, it's not too surprising that the NSI involving electron neutrinos 
is a better fit to the data than, what, than the NSI involving health case. Yeah, but I think to 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 really answer the question, I think you need actually to do the numerics and do the the data and see what the data says. I'm not sure if you can try to to uh, get a definite solution just uh, analytically or just by like thinking very hard. Apart from that, some kind of vague arguments, but it should be more important than this. Um, are there any cosmological uh, so for this, I mean, this, this is actually quite large, right? Yes. It has long value, so it could yes. like delay neutrino decoupling or something like that. Yes, so that's a very good point. Yeah, I wanted to come back to some cosmological observables. Yes, so um, people have studied um, NS, uh, the effect of NSI on cosmological observables for nuclear decoupling. Um, the cons so as far as I remember, the constraints were either rather weak or like Rather hand waving, I would say, because I think we actually need to do the simulation involving some new mediator, and I'm not sure how how feasible this is and how how easy this is at some level. Um, but, but what we could think of, for example, is that um, the presence of a new mediator or new coupling um, of neutrinos to to themselves, just neutrino neutrino self interactions, or um, new new scattering processes of um, Ultra high energies, neutrinos, with the cosmic neutrino background. And there are also some ongoing studies by people um, where they say, okay, we actually seem to see some dips and some, some bumps in the ultra high energy neutrino data from ice cubes, which could originate maybe from some um, LSI mediator, which um, in fact maybe scattering uh, ultra high energy uh, neutrinos coming from. The cosmos uh, scattering on, on the C and the, the cosmic neutrino background. Um, again, these studies, I think, I mean, they are viable, but we have to be like really careful because you don't know where these ultra high energy neutrinos come from. So there's an uncertainty in the sources, uncertainty in the redshift. So, in principle, there should be effects, but I think it's very hard to, to figure this out from the data itself. In this sense, there are um, not really very strong constraints um, from from cosmology based on NSI. Which kind of makes sense, right? Because like these these epsilons, it's some weak scale interaction. So it's not like you're gonna delay the decoupling of neutrinos in any significant way. But I guess if this small epsilon is a small coupling in a very light mediator, and maybe like you were saying, you can look for something analogous to like glass shell resonance, yeah, but not exactly. the Z, but this whatever lighter mediator there is, then maybe if the scale is low, then maybe you can Exactly, yeah. I think this is basically the idea behind these studies. Um, but so far, the constraints are, I would say, at best, hand wavy, maybe. So it's, yeah. But can you finish again the slide with Lagrangian of this in the side? Yes. Um, yeah, for example. So, yeah. So, and the F's here, I would uh, just charge that. Uh, they, they could, no, there could also be quarks. Yeah, um, but so if, yeah, if you have a mediator which introduces this operator, mm -hmm. one expects also there should be like four fermion interactions involving just quarks and leptons, and that's a probably yes. very strongly constrained. So it has some symmetry, which yeah, so that's a very good point, and that's also one of the problems I would say with this NSI model. So, I mean, introducing um, some non standard interactions is kind of very easy and I think as soon as you introduce like a new mediator which couples the standard model fermion, you're very likely going to have new coupling of neutrinos to the rest of the standard model generally. But of course um, you also introduce a new coupling of charged laptops to force things. Um, unavoidably somehow. Um, and in fact since we are preferring large NSI 0 0.2 and 10% of the uh, interaction and um, processes involving charge levels are very well studied. It's it's a problem to find actually models which can indeed give rise to these such large um, NSI parameters and still be okay with constraints. Um, there are two ways out, which is, for example, um, that you introduce only a direct coupling of the mediator to a sterile neutrino. And the sterile neutrino only mixes with the active neutrino. So you have 
you don't have, um, you don't introduce any new couplings of charge networks to the force or to sun and water particles, but only um, sun and water particles. This could be a way out, or you try to push your whole uh, inside physics into the first generation where the constraints are a bit weaker than for the first generation. But still, it's it's rather difficult to find um, models which have, have gone around your country. So this also means that if future data will tell us that there is indeed some preference by AI, we need to go back and try to come up with any good models which which would really allow for this. So right now I think there are two with two models out of a lot um, which could actually give us this large NFI and rely on stereo couplings or um, then we will be trying to come up maybe with some very intricate symmetry, introduce a lot more particles and get some symmetry arguments that you don't couple to the charge network, but only to the neutrinos. But it's these are maybe not the most um, easiest and most straightforward models. Question? So then your uh, panel told me you said that that interaction scale has the matter density, right? So would that change any of our understanding in like complex objects? So like say like solar neutrinos or white or or so indeed for solar neutrinos um and aside you have definitely an effect, effect um a very big effect in in, in craft. Uh, so there are of course then constraints. Um, from solar from solar neutrinos on MSI, these um, do not play a role here because the constraints are absolutely easy. So and this is not terribly easy when looking at. Uh, concerning white dwarfs, um, I would expect that MSI would also affect um, the physics the processes in white dwarfs. I'm not sure if there have been any studies on the constraints. Um, I'm not sure if we if our knowledge and uh, maybe the simulations required to do or to really take and try to count in white walks are that evolved <laughs> that you would really um, obtain robust reliable constraints. But I think this is definitely also a way to look at constraints. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Julia again. Thank you. Thank you.